Hello, I'm Devin Moore. I'm a Humanity Rising Ambassador and the founder of Hashtag Race Speak Up, an anti-bullying organization. Humanity Rising is a student-led movement to create a better world through service. We help students find their service passion and give them a voice to help them share what they're doing to make a positive difference in the world. Welcome to our Humanity Rising Voices podcast series, Creating World Peace Through Unity, hosted by Peace Service. We are really excited to have you guys here today. I had the opportunity to participate in an interview with Steve and Pranash the other day, and it was such an inspiring and impactful experience talking about peace and unity. Joining Steve today is Panash Desai. Panash is best-selling author, storyteller, and the business and life catalyst who, for over 10 years, has been using energetic transformation to positively change the lives of countless people around the globe. In his national best-selling book, You Are Enough, author and renowned spiritual leader, Panache Desai, provides a profound and accessible path to revealing our true selves and the potential and possibility it contains. There will be time for Q&A, and now I'll turn it over to Steve to begin. Panache, just nice to see you again. It's great to be with you too, Steve. And Devin, thank you for the introduction. Um, we started with this lovely song, and what I love about this group is that they put musicians from all over the world together and they harmonize as one. And it really, to me, illustrates the idea of us being a collective soul, especially at the end. I particularly like in this song, we have all the people singing um, and it, their voices come together as one from all over the world. And I really think that's just a material illustration of the spiritual truth. What do you think? I feel like the more we begin to lose our rigidity and the more we begin to go beyond these false divisive boundaries that have been empowered and the more we return to the infinite nature of the soul and begin to relate to each other through that lens of the soul, the more we will all as a collective expression called humanity be singing a song exactly like the one that we just heard to realize is that the, the divisive power of fear at some point is going to lose <clears throat> its control over us. And so in order for us to move forward, we have to shift the way we see ourselves. We have to shift the way that we see one another because we really are brothers and sisters living on this beautiful planet called Earth. It is. Um, fear is just a lack of faith, just like darkness is an ac ac absence of light and, and evil is the absence of good. And really, when we have full faith, we have no fear. So, you know, most of us have a little bit of lack of faith, and so we have a little bit of fear. But our job, instead of worrying about the fear, is to increase our faith, to increase our knowledge, so we have less ignorance, to increase our goodness, so we have less evil. We should focus on that, the positive things. And I know what you're talking about, focusing on the soul, the infinite. That is who we are. You know, as you said, this is a false reality. And right now we're in a world where uh, people are marching and saying black lives matter and brown lives and all color lives, but particularly black lives and particularly in America, because they haven't to, you know, of course black lives have always mattered, but people haven't acknowledged that. And I saw this awful video today where uh, a man had a, a black lives um, matter sign and, and he was in Arkansas and people were just saying awful things. Even after all this, that black lives didn't matter. It seems to me so tragic that humanity would miss these beautiful souls, these beautiful souls, just because of, you know, your, our, our skin tones, Panache, are slightly different color. But to me, I see your heart. And Devin's skin tone is slightly different, but I see his beautiful heart. And to me, we need to start, as you said, judging people by their souls getting these false barriers. Maybe you put it in your words instead of mine. Well, I feel like we're right now in the midst of integrating a wound that's the wound of colonialism that's based in divide and conquer. And so slavery is a product of that collective wound of colonialism, where a group of people made themselves better than another group of people in order to take advantage of their natural resources to enrich themselves to enrich their lives and to give them some false power or status 
Now, that isn't a new narrative. That's a narrative that we've seen play out over and over again. We've had different versions of dictators and people who have used their influence to make themselves better than another person. But you see, what I see happening is this great kind of equalization unfolding right now. What we're realizing is that we're actually not that different. We're beginning to realize that Yes, we may come from different parts of the world and pray differently or eat different foods or have different cultural influences. But at the end of the day, we're living in this collective shared experience called being human. And it's that collective shared experience of the heart that you so beautifully articulated that is the unifying principle because the heart exists beyond belief. Love doesn't need agreement. You just love for the sake of loving. I once shared that we'll never come to agreement at the level of the mind, but you can absolutely love everybody. Now, just imagine if we could begin to see beyond these false divisions, these false boundaries that were put into place by colonialism, and we could begin to start to get in touch with the unification that existed before any particular group designated themselves as better or superior. Because the truth is, in God's eyes, we're all equal. In God's eyes, we're all the same. That's the basic principle of oneness. There is no hierarchy. There's nobody ahead. There's nobody behind. You see, at some point, humanity needs to realize that we're all in this together, <laughs> that we're all holding hands, walking each other home to the heart, to love. And that's the blessing. That's the greatest joy. And that's why conversations like this are so important because yes, we may look different. And yes, we may have had different experiences or come from different backgrounds, but at the level of our heart, at the level of our soul, we are already one. And that's what's emerging, Steve. And that's what makes this time so powerful. It's what makes this time so important. O oh, children of men, know ye not why we've created you all from the same dust, that no one should exalt himself over the other. Mm. Ponder at all times in your hearts how you were created. Since we have created you all from one same substance, it is incumbent on you to be even as one soul, to walk with the same feet, eat with mm -hmm. the same mouth, and dwell in the same land. That from your inmost being, by, by your deeds and actions, the signs of oneness and the essence of detachment shall be made manifest. From Baha'u'llah, that's one from his hidden words. We're one soul. This is what's really interesting is that was written in the 1850s. So 170 years ago, he was writing that we're one soul. And that was a time when colonialism, as you mentioned, was still in full flower. But he was showing the world as it was going to be. A world where, there were, that where India would be free and, and Africa would be free and China and all the South America and, and Central America. We are still fighting through that. We're still fighting through the after effects. We're fighting through the anger and the hurt. You know, in, in this country, the 400 years of endemic racism that we've suffered through, which is, you know, as you said, colonialism and racism, which kind of go hand in hand, but they're a little bit separate, but they're both evils that we need to undo. And uh, there's some of us that say, oh, well, it's done. You know, you're free now. Well, if I've been on your neck for 400 years and I just say, hey, you're free, is that really enough? Or do we have to undo all the things that were built into our society? You know, colonialism didn't go into place in a day and it won't go out in a day. But one of the key things I want to point out about colonialism, and you mentioned it, it was for resources. It was for wealth. What's true wealth, though? Panash, what is, what is true wealth to you? Is it material wealth? Mm. True wealth for me is peace. Sure. I've met some of the wealthiest people in the world, but they don't know themselves. They don't understand who they are. They don't understand how loved they are by God. Therefore, they have nothing. So some of the wealthiest are the most impoverished because they know not the value of their own heart and their own being. And so when we come to know the truth of who we are and live in harmony and connection with that love and that essence, that's wealth. And also we begin to realize that, guess what? It's about getting to a place of enough. When is enough? At what point are our needs being met? At what point do we wake up to realizing that we're the custodians of this beautiful planet, that this planet is a gift to us, that every single thing that's a part of this collective ecosystem called life is unfolding for this greater possibility of our expression to even exist? Trillions of processes in nature. And so as we continue to move forward, at some point we have to return that respect, give up this notion of ownership and return to that 
custodian principle, which our indigenous brothers and sisters held so sacred because they realized that nothing belonged to them. Everything belonged to God and they were here to simply make it better within the course of their life, to enhance it, to enrich it, or at least not to infringe upon it with any intention other than love. I, I love what you just said. I, I'm going to add to what you just said. I'm going to read another uh, verse of the hidden words. And I think you'll like this because it says almost what you said. It says, O oh, ye that pride yourself on mortal riches, know ye in truth that wealth, the mighty barrier between the seeker and his desire, the lover and his beloved, the rich but for a few shall in no wise attain the court of his presence, nor the, enter the city of content and resignation. Well is it with him then, who being rich is not hindered by his riches from the eternal kingdom, nor deprived by them of imperishable dominion. By the most great name, the splendor of such a wealthy man shall illuminate the dwellers of heaven, even as the sun enlightens the peoples of the earth. So it's not all rich people, but a lot. And wealth, I can attest as one of those wealthy people, that it's, it's a challenge because you've got all of these material desires sitting right in front of you. You, you can lose yourself in material things. I've never had a lot of desire for material things. I have a t-shirt on, I drive a Prius, I'm not. That's my only car, I have one house. I just never really cared to buy a lot. Mm. Um, so I was very fortunate, but I, I've seen it because of the people I get to meet in my position. I, I agree with you that um, I've met people as you've described, and I, I, all I hope for them is that they find God. That's all I hope for anybody. You know, we're all souls. And so if I see someone who hasn't found God, I just wish that they find God and that they find spiritual happiness because yeah. really we're in it together. And that's one of the real big things when you talk about this unity and this oneness, it's not about hating the other person. And, and that's something I'll say because in this movement, you know, there's, there's a, a movement to shame people and to hate people. Um, I actually talked to one of, by the way, Panash, you're now one of my new heroes, but uh, after talking to you a couple of times, but one of my heroes said, have you ever heard the name Daryl Davis? Yes, I love Daryl Davis. So I got to talk to him today for 10 minutes. Have you ever uh, met him? I haven't met him, but I, heard, I watched the interview with Joe Rogan. I heard the whole story. Yeah, so if you, if I, I'll have to introduce you guys. I'm sure you would love him. I mean, I absolutely love him. So for um, those of you listening, Daryl Davis is one of my personal heroes. He's a black musician who goes to KKK rallies and befriends people from the KKK. Now, I know that sounds utterly fantastical. I mean, how could he do it? But he, he's done it. And he collects their robes after they leave the KKK, which has happened a couple hundred times. One man has, and so I always talk about him because in this world where it's all about contention and strife and I hate you more than you hate me, Daryl Davis is doing it with love. He's doing it the panache way. He's saying, and he really does this. And I asked him about it. I said, are you ever scared? And he says, well, you know, he's human. Are you ever threatened? He says, well, I've had to defend myself a couple times. I said, I, I said, I don't even know how you do it. <laughs> but he was so nice. And, and the other thing that was very clear, so smart. So very, very smart. And just um, a class act all around. I, I, I just, I just, did, I could have talked to him all day. Aww. It was, it was a, a wonderful story. And, and at first it's like, when you hear it, you're like, this doesn't make any sense. But you know what? Love doesn't make any sense. It doesn't have to make sense. People feel the love that's emanating from you. It touches their heart and their heart begins to change. What's missing in the world isn't an absence of opportunity or advancement. What's missing in the world is an absence of love. People want to be embraced. They want to know that they matter. And the more we embrace them and the more we love them, the more they realize that we're actually more similar than we are different. One of my favorite stories was I think Sometimes. he eventually had one of these KKK members over to his house <laughs> and like they were going to each other's houses and, and the commonality was the music. Everybody shared a love for music. And so that was his entry point into bringing this uh, whole group of individuals who were basically indoctrinated into hating a whole group of people just because they were told to do so into finally walking away from it and realizing that that hate was completely misplaced. The prayer, my, my greatest prayer is that everybody have a direct revelation of God. I don't think it's enough to just have an understanding of God. My greatest prayer is that everybody have a direct revelation and experience of God, because after that experience, your heart will be forever transformed 
And wherever you go, you will see that divinity in everyone that you meet. Well, I've been there. Um, actually, I can tell you what happened to me. I can just tell you my personal story. Yeah. I'm going to switch my picture. And that the picture, this is one of my favorite pictures. This is the Shrine of the Bab. But my experience happened here, which is the next town over, which is Akko, Israel. I walked into this garden on September 12, 2014. I remember the day. And I walked in as one person, and this is where I met God. This is the shrine of Baha'u'llah. Now, as a Baha'i, I wasn't a Baha'i then. I, was, I, I believed in Baha'u'llah then, but I had not officially declared as a Baha'i. As a Baha'i, I believe that Baha'u'llah is the Lord of our age, kind of like a Christian would say about Jesus. He's the messenger of God. He's not God, but he's the one who brings God's word for the sage. And I believe that going into the garden, but I hadn't met him in my heart, really. I had, it was in my head. And all of a sudden, boom, in an instant, it was in my heart. And I can honestly say, I, I can't even put into words how true your words are. Because my whole world changed. I literally started crying. I saw, and you mentioned another thing, that love is peace. I saw world peace instantly in that garden. I said, this garden is world peace. His words are world peace. Behold, I spent 40 years telling the world how to get to peace. That we're one human family, that we're one human race, that women are equal to men, that, that there's only, he said, the earth is but one country, mankind and citizens. Um, and he said that all the religions are one, that all this fighting over religion is crazy. He said, there's one God and he's been telling us to love us and we might want to do that. And so, so all of these things are saying, he's, he's saying, and I and knew, I read some of them before I went to the garden, but I instantly knew them. The other thing I instantly knew leaving that garden was that we're in a new age. And in this new age, its essence is unity and oneness. Everything you're saying is, is, is the watchword of the age. And so I really felt it. Um, what's interesting is I had some physical effects leaving that garden. Mm. And you probably understand this very well, is I didn't sleep very well. Well, I slept very well, but I slept three or four hours a night for several months after that. My wife kept saying, you're gonna get sick. I never did. I was happier than I'd ever been. I uh, ended up declaring less than six months later as a Baha'i. I was also, interestingly enough, I'm a competitive runner. I instantly got faster. And I just had lots of, you know, physically I was healthy as a horse for a year and a half after that. No, not even a common cold. Mm -hmm. I just felt for a little while just different. Like I was walking on a different plane. And I, I think that I've never really lost that moment. And ever since then, my love of God, but most importantly, my love of his creation has been magnified. So when I meet a person, I just love them more. And that's exactly what you're saying. It's amazing because what you're describing is the, is being relieved of the burden of being yourself. And the self yeah. that I'm talking about is the self that's suffering, you know, this fear-based identity that has to scratch and claw and compete and manipulate and dominate in order to get ahead because you're just living by a whole other set of rules other than the rules of nature. And so what you're talking about is the complete unveiling of the divinity that lives within you. And from that moment forth, once you're freed of the burden of being yourself, this individuated pain-based entity, uh, you're at that moment, you stop projecting that onto everyone around you. And you re you're reunified with the love that you really are, right? Love is your natural state. And then you begin to see that in everyone. You begin to meet that in everyone because the world is as you are. The world reflects back to you your own state of being. And so from that moment, literally, that experience in that garden shows you that you're always living in the garden. <laughs> well, we are living in the garden. That yes. was reality. And, and I've said that yeah. many times that, that our true reality is absolute unity. Yeah. And there is no, um, first of all, there is no separation in religion, mm -hmm. which is one of the big problems. Now, some people try to throw out religion. I don't. I, I think religion is wonderful. But I think all religions are wonderful. So I always say, I'm, you know, I've said this a few times, I'm, I'm a Jew as long as I can be a Christian. I'm a Christian as long as I can be a Muslim. And I'm a Muslim as long as I can be a Baha'i. And I'm also... Mm -hmm a Buddhist and a, and a Hindu, I love people of all faiths and I love people of no faith. My problem with religion is not religion itself. It's when it becomes a wall between us. Mm. Same thing with nationality. I happen to love America. America's great. I've been here my whole life. But when it becomes a wall between me and, for example, a Canadian or a Mexican or an Indian or uh, an Egyptian, then my, then my patriotism is a problem. We have to love the world more than we love our country. Love our country, but love the world more. Love our religion, sure, I can love the Baha'i faith, but if it means that I hate a Christian, then I'm, I'm, I'm not understanding what Baha'u'llah would say. 
it goes for everything. Everything. It's it's beautiful because I think as human beings we've forgotten who whatever who who what everything belongs to. Everything belongs to God, right? So we've taken we've taken credit for that which doesn't belong to us in the first place. You know, every innovation that comes into our mind comes from God. Every opportunity that comes into our life comes from God. In fact, what we're doing is witnessing the perfection of God's perfect unfolding. We're alive at a point in human history that is just awe-inspiring. What's happening right now is a product of years and years and years of prayer, worship, and devotion, where, the, where literally the, the calibration of consciousness on the planet is raising out of survival into love and unity. I mean, this is such an exciting time. And people are beginning to wake up from the control and the fear and the division. And they're beginning to realize that they have, they have a power within them. They have this light within them. They have this love within them that something amazing is emerging and being kindled in the hearts of all human beings. And so it's beautiful because my deepest wish is that every single person have the revelation that you had in their own way, wherever they are, you know, as, as destined, as is destined for them by God, because in that moment, they'll realize that this entity that they've been protecting and defending, which is just in pain, they needed, they didn't need to protect and defend in the first place. That actually separation is a complete illusion. And that oneness is the absolute truth. <laughs> love is what's real. And if we're unable to perceive that love, then we're living inside of a distortion that's based in our own pain. I did a podcast a few days ago, and this girl asked me a question about cultural appropriation and cancel culture. And I said, well, listen, you can't cancel love. You're not going to cancel empathy. You're not going to cancel kindness. You're not going to cancel authenticity. I said, what's being canceled is inauthenticity. What's being canceled is everything that isn't aligned with love. But the truth is, we can't cancel things. What we have to do is embrace them and welcome them because in embracing them and welcoming them, they're transformed in the human heart. And it's that alchemy. It's that embracing of every aspect of who we are, that transformation in the human heart that restores the experience of divinity and harmony in the world. Also this story about cultural appropriation. All of a sudden there's this whole big hotbed topic about people doing yoga and chanting mantras. And, and I said, listen, I used to have a problem with that. But I realized that the only reason why I had a problem with it was because I had a wound inside of myself that I had yet to accept, embrace, and love. And you know what? Now that I've embraced that, I don't have a problem with anything that anybody's doing. Nothing belongs to us. It's all a giant illusion anyway. So how about we find whatever medium that we can find to return to peace and harmony, to elevate out of survival, and to have this moment of revelation? Because that moment of revelation is everyone's eventual destiny. You can have it now while you're alive and be born unto yourself, or you can have it when you're dead, rewatch the whole movie and realize that God was in charge of the whole thing. It's up to you. I, I agree. Uh, in terms of that, the idea of cultural appropriation and, and, and I'll say religious appropriation. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, Hindus don't own Krishna. He came for the whole world and Christians mm -hmm. don't own Jesus. He came for the whole world and Baha'is don't own Baha'u'llah. He came for the whole world. Um, God is not to be put in a box and nor are his messengers. And even us as people, as you've mentioned, don't, we shouldn't be put in a box. We're, we are part of the infinite. We're reflecting the infinite God. So are the trees, so are the flowers. And this infinite is one. Um, the Bob, actually, I, I made a movie about the Bob and the Bob said something so incredible and it took me a while to digest it, but he really said reality is one. He said, when you really break it down, we are one with the flowers. We are one yeah. with the trees. We are one with all humans. You just have to go up another high enough level to see that. Yes. And we are one. And, and because of that, this idea, this, this native indigenous idea of, 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 of as caretakers of the world is we, we're, we're in charge, not in, in, a, in a bad way. We are. The humans are the highest. If you look at hierarchy, the human soul is the highest from a spiritual point of view. But we are the highest in order to be the custodians, as you said, not to be the destroyers. Mm. And this, that's where the indigenous ideas are right. What we need to do is take this Humpty Dumpty puzzle. And that's the thing I was going to ask you next, really, in terms of it, because you know, you've talked about, about love and perfection, which I agree with. But what do I say to someone, and I'm sure you get asked this question all the time, about all, everything you see in the news, the division, the strife. How do we walk in a world like this and yet still have this beautiful vision that you're talking about? Well, let's take a look at the news and the function of the news and what the news does. <laughs> so the news is designed to keep you off balance. Basically, it's always fear-based. It's a constant stream of it. 
And what you have to do is look at who owns the news. <laughs> you have to dig a little bit further. All you have to do is begin to look at how the news is being used. And the question is, is the news even the news anymore? Are they actually reporting anything? Or are we just stuck in a 24-7, 365 cycle of sensationalism? Because it's what it feels like. And it doesn't matter what version of the news you're... In fact, what you have to do now is watch three or four different versions of the news to try and piece together what the truth actually may be. <laughs> so, but what's it doing to us? It's reporting a version of reality that's an old paradigm. What is the actual truth? The truth is we're living longer. The truth is there are less diseases. The truth is we are more peaceful and prosperous now than we ever have been in human history. That people have access to information more than they have ever had at any other point in time and space. That we are more together, more united, and more in this oneness than we ever have been. That's the news, but that's the version of the news that isn't being reported. The version of the news that's being reported is the division that keeps us in this consumer-based society. Why? Because all of a sudden, if we're fear-based, then we're missing something, we're not enough, we're empty, and we go and fill that void by consuming. It also keeps us producing so we can consume more until eventually we get to 65 and retire. And then we consume based on whatever it is that our 401k has in it, based on what the Fed decides to do and how well we invested through the course of our life, right? But is that living? No, that's not living, that's surviving. It's not living, it's surviving. What is living? Living is walking with the awareness of who you are in your heart in every moment. That is living. And what are you living for? To further that truth in the world to further that truth in the world, to deliver the good news unto the world, to speak life into the world, to share love into the world, to let everybody know that they're your brother and sister, to unify the world, that's living. That's what life is. Do you, um, you know the word gospel, right? Mm -hmm. You know what it means? I don't know the exact translation. Enlighten me, Steve. Good news. Uh -huh. See, it so is the good news. So when Christians talk about the gospel, they're talking about the good news. And interestingly enough, everything you said is the actual gospel. You know, Jesus Christ came to spread that good news, that love, that kindness, that unity. By the way, I could substitute out Jesus Christ and I could say Muhammad. I could say mm -hmm. Christian. I could say Buddha. I could say Baha'u'llah. That's the gospel. The gospel is everything you just said, that mm -hmm. we're one, that we're supposed to love each other, that we're not supposed to hate, and, and that we're supposed to live actually an elevated life you know one of the things that i think that people don't realize is this material life it's, it extends to a lot of things our selfish desires are not what we're living for you know as you said we're, we're a spiritual being we're a soul and our soul you know what makes a soul happy in the long run and again you can talk to god when you die but he's told us in our holy books love kindness compassion mercy service to be gracious, to be kind, to be compassionate, to be wise, to be patient. This makes your soul happy. And it's very interesting. Um, I have a, a Baha'i friend by the name of Rain Wilson. You might know him better as Dwight Schrute. Uh, he plays that on, on uh, The Office. But he uh, was giving a speech uh, several months ago. Did, did I tell you this about doing service versus uh, following your selfish desires? No. So he did a study and he sent kids out. Um, first, they, they, first they did their base test to see how happy they were and they got their base test. And then the next first weekend they said, go out and have fun, do whatever makes you happy. So they did whatever they thought made them happy. And I can't repeat any of a lot of what they probably did in public, but I'm sure it involved drugs and alcohol and, you know, some other things that they came back the next week and they measured them again. They'd done everything they thought it made them happy. Do you think they were happier, fully happy or less happy? Completely less happy. Absolutely. So the next weekend, they send them out and they say, be of service. We're not going to tell you what to do, but whatever you do, you have to be of service with, you know, help a, a little old lady or man across the street, um, you know, go help your parents, go help your friends, go serve at a food pantry. So they all went out and did service, came back the next week, measured them equally to their baseline, less happy or more happy. Off the charts happy. Of course. It's so obvious. Um, it's so obvious that we're supposed to serve. We're, we are hardwired to serve humanity. Yeah. We just need to do it. And yeah, so it's all there. It's all out there. Well, you know, I really love your message. I love your message of peace and unity. I share your message of peace and unity. 
And the thing I'll tell people is we've got, you know, this is the Baha'i uh, writings and, and the universal House of justice, is we've got two processes going on. One is the tearing down of this old world order that you're talking about, this, this colonialism, this separation, this division. And it's in the news, and, and it's real actually to some extent, um, this, this division, because that's, that's the old world order. Think of that like the big trees falling down and they fall down with a huge bang. But what you don't see are these little saplings growing up all right next to them. They don't make so much noise as they're growing, but they're growing nonetheless. And there's more and more of them every day, as you're saying, the awakening souls. And Panasha, I really appreciate the work you're doing to awaken souls. I really appreciate that, that you are um, out there telling people that we're one, telling people that that these separations are, are false and I couldn't agree more. That is, that is the Baha'i message that, you know, the oneness of humanity is our central message. Frankly, it was the message of Christianity. I have a, I have a good friend who's Christian and we're having this debate right now. And he says, well, the Bible doesn't say we're all children of men, children of God. He says, only the Christians are. It's true. I went through the Bible after he said that. I thought that the Bible said we were all, but he said, no, if you're a child of God, it's by following Christ. And actually, in that day, if you go back 2,000 years ago, that's, the, that's what it meant, because that was the a most unity that humanity could understand at that time. But today, as you say, we're at this new level of understanding. And we can understand now that we're one world. That whether you're born in England, or you're born in America, or whether you're born in India, or you're China, we, you know, the same God, the same sky, the same air. And if we're not careful, the same disease as COVID has proven. What's interesting, I think COVID, uh, as, as much as it's, it's been bad, it's, you know, and maybe I'll ask you, um, you know, what do you make of the COVID crisis? You know, from a, from a spiritual point. I, want, I, want... I, I, I make of it as a necessary intervention and a necessary pause. I, I, I uh, actually did a meditation this morning and I said, 2020 has been renamed Trigger Fest. It's like God and a part of God's unfolding planned a year where everything that was stuck inside of us that was unconscious was going to be activated by somebody. It's like you can't do anything anymore without being triggered by someone. Everyone's upset at something. But the people that are really evolving are the ones that are being accountable and responsible for what's going on inside of them in relationship to what's happening outside of them. So 2020 is trigger fest. Everything in you that is unresolved and that you haven't loved is going to be brought to the surface so that you can love it and you can see it. So there's an acceleration happening and we're being presented with these larger and larger uh, figures that are delivering these messages of division so that we can wake up by looking into them and seeing that they're not true. We're not buying into them anymore, right? So for me, COVID has been an amazing blessing because I've been able to be of service. My children are home with me. My, you know, we're, we've been spending time as a family. You know, we've been spending time with each other, loving one another, supporting each other. And are there days when my kids just want to go to a park and run around? Yeah, there are. So where we can, we take them and let them run around. But for the most part, we're happy at home. We're happy here. We're happiest together. So COVID is the reunification of the family. It's the reuniting yes. of the core that needs to be reunited in order to facilitate the exchange of energy that happens between parents and their children to facilitate this feeling of safety and this feeling of being cherished and valued. So literally COVID is enforcing that. COVID is also forcing us to drop all of our inauthenticity and all of our baggage, disengage from all of the lies, disengage from all of the programming and conditioning and begin to realize what really matters and what we actually need. Because what we actually need is some form of shelter. If you're like me, maybe a smoothie in the morning, something for lunch, maybe dinner. And that's about it. So what do we actually need? And when we start to live according to what we actually need and what we require, as opposed to what we've brainwashed into believing we should have because we've reached a certain point in our lives, that's the moment that the world is going to shift. Because in that moment, all of a sudden, humanity will return to nature. And we'll be at that no different than anything else in nature. And so this has just been an amazing time, Steve, an amazing blessing in the midst of global upheaval at an unprecedented level. 
Well, COVID has given us, and I'm going to say this because you said meditation, COVID, COVID has really given us almost a global meditation. Yes. You know, instead of us get, being in a traffic jam going to work, we're sitting at home and we're looking at our family. We're having to deal with our family Yes. You know, and talk to our family. And, you know, I was one of those who was traveling all over the world. I, I assume you did a bit of travel as well. And yeah. now we're not traveling and the kids are home and they're having to deal with their parents. You know, my kids are 17. I'm sure that at times they'd prefer their dad not be home. But, uh, you know, I, you know, sometimes my son is 17. I just give him a big hug. He's like, no, 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 I'm giving you a hug because I can and I will. And I don't care. <laughs> That's the abuse you're going to have to take today. Uh, we, are, we are learning how to, as you said, restore these, these beautiful bonds of family, which we were, we were ignoring. And we also take a collective breath. As you talk about meditation, think of this idea. What, what's amazing is we've just gone through 43 minutes of a conversation that's felt like three minutes to me. Panache, it has been such a pleasure talking to you tonight and listening to you and having this conversation. And Devin, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. My, my final thing, namaste to both of you. And may this garden of peace go to all humanity. To you young people who are listening, may you be a beacon of peace. May your generation brings the world to peace. And I totally agree with Panache. Start by working on yourself and your own inner peace. Feed your soul every day. With, with great love, and with peace, um, let's uh, sign off. I love you both very much. Thank you. Thank you, Devin. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you. Namaste. Namaste. Namaste.